Danielle Allen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Yasha. I really appreciate your having me on. It's good to be with you. Well, I really look forward to this conversation. So I feel like from a debate about liberalism, which used to be a kind of academic debate and has already become a much more urgent political debate, the camps are often people who want to defend liberalism and its achievements on the one side, and people who want to blame liberalism for all the bad things in the world and then argue that we need to get rid of it or supplant it on the other side. And you have an interesting position in this debate, like many other people, I think at some level, I would describe myself in similar ways as somebody who sees the flaws of liberalism and sees the need to reform it, but ultimately wants to defend liberalism. So what are some of the things that traditional liberals got right? And what are some of the things that traditional liberals got wrong such that we need amendments to it, we need a renovation of it? Thank you so much, Yasha. And I just want to start out by acknowledging what a heated political moment this is. And that's true in the US, of course, but it's also true in nearly every European country. And of course, with the challenge of Russia's war against Ukraine as well. So it's a really hard political moment. And sort of the opposite of the end of history that Francis Fukuyama, you know, predicted when the Cold War fell. And it looked as if liberalism was sort of all ascendant. And so I am grateful to you for opening up a conversation about core ideas. Liberalism takes us down a road into philosophy, and often it can be hard to bring philosophy into conversation in the middle of a heated political moment. So I'm just grateful to you for making space for that. And I think your question is so important because what it also points to is how there have always been varieties of liberalisms. You know, so liberalism isn't just one thing. There have been varieties of liberalism, and it's really important to pay attention to what those have been. But you have to start, of course, from the core. And at the core is just really the commitment to basic rights, basic human rights. And so then, for me, the question is about the varieties of liberalism, which categories of rights are at the focus of any given liberalism? You know, you have your liberalisms that really focus on things like freedom of expression or freedom of contract and free market participation. Philosophers will call those the negative freedoms, freedoms from interference. And then you have varieties of liberalism that focus on the right to participate, to vote, to run for office, to help see and shape your community. And philosophers will call those the positive liberties. And I think liberalism has gone wrong when it has chosen the negative liberties, the liberties about our own autonomous private spheres separate from everybody else, where we control things, we consume things and the like. Liberalism has gone wrong when it has focused exclusively there. And liberalism goes right, I believe, when we focus just as much on the positive liberties of participation, of playing a role as a co-author of our collective lives and our political decisions. What does it mean when you say that liberalism is sort of focused too much or perhaps in some context exclusively on those negative liberties? Because as you've outlined them, uh, certainly in the self-understanding of the United States and of most liberal democracies today, we think of the need of both of those, right? Clearly, the, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, some basic economic freedom is a core part of our political system and something that we're rightly proud of. But the ability to vote, the ability to run for office, the ability to have free and fair elections are also thought of as being really at the core of our political system. But obviously, it doesn't mean that every country has been able to sustain that or that every country has been able to sustain that for all of its citizens. But it feels sort of comfortably within the mainstream of a tradition as an aspiration that we should have. So what does it mean in practice to over-index on the negative liberties and to neglect the positive liberties? Where do you see the kind of applications of that or the problems that stem from that? So I think you honestly give us all too much credit in the picture that you just painted. I don't think we have been so good at holding on tight to the positive liberties of participation and the like. And I think one can see this in all kinds of ways. I mean, so I said there are varieties of liberalism. Let me just name three that are conventionally recognized for starters. There's classical liberalism of late 18th and 19th century. There's Keynesian or Rooseveltian liberalism of the early 20th century. And then there is also neoliberalism. And I think if you go back to the sort of earliest variant, it's fair to say that across those kinds of liberalisms, there was a sort of recognition of both categories of rights. Though, of course, famously, the French philosopher Benjamin Constant drew a distinction between those. You can call the sort of 
negative liberties, the liberties of the moderns, you know, those were the ones that protected the kind of commercial activity of the modern economy. And then the ancient liberties were those that protected those rights of participation. And his view was that at the end of the day, we should prefer those negative liberties, the commercial liberties, where again, we are free from interference and can tend to our own gardens, build our own prosperity, because of course, prosperity provides a certain kind of important degree of autonomy. And I think we've neglected the fact that, you know, even when you come to the early 20th century mo moment, you look at Roosevelt, think of his four freedoms. What are they? Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. None of those are actually the positive liberties. They're all about how we live in terms of our own pursuit of a good, what we want to worship, what we want to talk about, freedom from want, freedom from fear, a certain kind of protection from the vicissitudes of life. But they're not about the freedom to participate, the freedom to be a decision maker, for example. And I think those themes have been carried through consistently. So, so I fear that I'm going to take us too deep into political theory territory, but that happens when two political theorists talk to each other. I guess I was surprised by a characterization of Constant because he distinguishes in one of my favorite texts, the, the liberty of the ancients from that of the moderns in terms of political participation really being part of the purpose of life for the ancients. And he thinks that trying to recreate that under modern conditions is really hard because we live in these big nation states and all of these other kind of change conditions, which make that make it harder for politics to have the same kind of priority in people's lives. But he does recognize very clearly political rights as part of the liberties of the moderns, right? He does talk about elections and the ability to vote for people and the ability to vote out your representatives if they're not, in fact, serving your interests. So there's some element for political rights there. So I guess, how deep do we have to go on those political rights? Does it have to be just a part of what sustains our political system and what makes sure the government doesn't abuse its powers and so on? Or do you think that to take positive rights seriously in that way really is more like re-importing some of the ancient vision of every citizen participating in politics to such an extent that it becomes a part of the meaning of their life? Thank you. I think that's exactly the right question. And when you look at the place Constant gives to the political rights and to participation, it's instrumental. We need to participate to the degree that we need to protect ourselves so that we can have the access to those private rights and that private sphere of autonomy. The point of the ancient conception is that participation is actually a part of the human good. Empowerment, the actual experience of empowerment is a component of human flourishing. I am making the case that we need to recover that idea. Absent that idea, our politics is paternalistic and technocratic. That's the problem with our politics. And I think precisely because it's paternalistic and technocratic, it works very well for elites, incredibly well for elites. It's like the perfect package for elites. But for those who have been subject to oppression and domination over time, the point to be made is always driven home. And it doesn't matter if it's David Walker or Frederick Douglass or W.B. Du Bois is we will own and direct and steer our own lives. That requires empowerment, at that collective level. And it's not just instrumental, it's not just about self-protection, it's about that full human dignity. So the kind of human dignity that elites claim as technocrats, as steerers of policy, um, is a dignity that everybody deserves access to. And what does that look like in concrete terms? Now I'm trying to get away a little bit from the political theory. So what about our institutions? What about our social reality today in the United States, or for that matter, in countries in Europe or beyond? is sort of misshaped by our lack of attention to politics as a dimension or as an area in which people can have a form of self-fulfillment. What would we learn and what would we do differently if we took that insight seriously? Maybe I'll just tell a specific story that comes out of the COVID context that was a real good sort of eye-opening moment for myself about the problem with the sort of elite perspective on decision-making. And I had and have a research group at Harvard that combines people from public health, medicine, law, economics, and so forth. We've been working on other public health problems pre-COVID. So when the pandemic hit, we were ready and we were able to do a lot of COVID response work. And we actually put out the first roadmap in the country, arguing for a real ramp up of public sector investment in testing, the infrastructure of testing. And we put out a kind of 
number that we thought. So what was the scale of testing that the country needed to get up to in order to be able to control the disease? And we put this out in a, this roadmap form in April 2020. And we had also built up a network of mayors around the country to help us think about response. And so we shared the roadmap with them, thinking that we were giving them this incredible solution. And their response to it was, well, that's great. But when you tell me we need, you know, X millions of tests a day, like, what does that actually mean for me? What levers can I pull in my community? What difference can I make? This doesn't help me at all. And they asked us to go back and to rewrite our roadmap from their perspective, from the perspective of how could they act, take actions on behalf of their community that in aggregate, if they all were walk, proling in the same direction, would add up to the policy the country needed. So we rewrote our roadmap from that local context specific point of view. We put power in their hands in so doing, but it was only possible because we had actually given them the power to help set the agenda for how we should be drafting policy in the first place. And I think you can make that point sort of all the way down. Those mayors, too, the ones who succeeded, succeeded best when they turned around to their community and said, okay, what questions are you trying to answer? How can I help you answer those questions? That's what it means to fully empower people from a participatory point of view all the way through our federal structure. So I think I always find myself really torn on this topic, right? Because on the one hand, I think a lot of people do want to participate in politics and don't feel invited to do so, don't have resources to do so, uh, kept from doing so, and that's a serious problem. I think a lot of the time, I completely agree with you, the policies we have and a lot of the decisions we have so influenced and controlled by an affluent, highly educated elite, but often has its own kind of social milieu that it really doesn't track what people want. And that's actually one of the real drivers of social and political conflict in our society. And presumably participation could help to address that. And so it becomes very, very tempting to imagine this world in which we find mechanisms for everybody to participate much more fully and so on. I guess I'm also aware of the fact that the two of us are really weird and everybody listening to this podcast is really weird <laughs> in that We've chosen to build our lives around thinking about politics. And everybody who's listening to this podcast is choosing to spend their free time to listen to two people argue about politics. And so our preferences in the world and our idea of what we want to do with our lives are just very, very different from most people, right? Some of whom have real political interests and some of whom hate politics, and a lot of whom have some political interests and so far as it affects their lives and want to have some say, but they also want to go and, you know raise their families and go after their jobs, which have nothing to do with politics for most people, or just have fun with their friends. And so how do we balance that different set of preferences? How do we build a polity where there is meaningful participation and people certainly feel that political equality, but we're not building it on the sort of utopian idea that everybody wants to participate in politics and is going to sort of enjoy sitting around a seminar room or being an activist all day long? How do we balance between real openness to participation and the fact that some people will simply choose not to think that much about politics. And just to add one more complication, what we don't want, of course, is that those 10% of people who are super into politics make all the decisions because for all kinds of reasons, they probably are really unrepresentative of the other 90%. No, thank you. I mean, I think that's exactly right. And I think that throughout the sort of 90s and early 2000s, there was a sort of very romanticized picture of what democracy ought to be that did involve that kind of conception of sort of everybody participating all the time, big deliberative assemblies and things like that. And that's not the case I'm making. I'm making a different case for what I call power sharing liberalism. It's a new kind of sort of reconstructed variant of liberalism that I would put on the table now, you know, in the wake of neoliberalism. And the point of power sharing liberalism is that for any given decision that has to be made, you want to make sure that the decision making structure is pulling all affected into the process. Sometimes representation is exactly enough to do that if representation is working, right? If you take a look at Massachusetts, for example, we have a population that is dissatisfied with our situation on housing that is dissatisfied with our situation on transportation, that is dissatisfied with our situation on the black-white wealth gap, that is dissatisfied with the relationship or response to the opioid epidemic in the state, sort of all of those different dimensions, dissatisfied on schools. We also have a population where we have the lowest voting registration rate for African Americans in the country, 42%. The lowest, Massachusetts is 50th for the level of participation by African Americans. We have an unrepresentative legislature, we have cities where the population is majority people of color, but we don't have office holders of color. 
So in those instances, obviously, you know, representation itself is failing actually to achieve the kind of participation that would channel the frustration people have with basic building blocks of well-being into policy. So representation might be enough, but we have to be really clear on the places where it's not even working to do what it's supposed to do. And then there's the question of, as our demography changes, as our social and economic circumstances change, where do we need to be innovative with regard to our governance mechanisms? Where do we have problems? For example, the siting of energy infrastructure that don't actually track our existing jurisdictional structure. The question of how we might have a regional energy infrastructure that could support a cheap, clean energy economy doesn't track city level, doesn't track the state level, doesn't track the federal level. So we have a sort of gap between our structures for appropriately representing and pulling participation in and the kinds of decisions that need to be made. And I think in spots like that, we need innovation. We need governance innovation to make sure that we have decision-making structures that are simultaneously effective and inclusive, pulling people in to participation as appropriate, but not in that sort of romanticized, we all just sort of sit around talking all the time about everything kind of way. And what does that mean concretely? And I know that, you know, you ran for governor of Massachusetts, you can put on a political hat, not just a philosopher's hat, you know, who decides in what kind of way who's affected? And how do we make sure that we don't fall into a trap that I sort of perceive quite a lot in American politics at the moment where, uh, you know, there are stakeholders in society, the people who speak for them often don't have very organic links to those groups, right? The person who says that they're representing Latinos isn't necessarily in accordance with what most Latinos believe politically. And we see that, I think that's an electoral challenge for Democrats often, because they think that by taking meetings with, you know, the presidents of various activist groups, they actually are figuring out how to win the votes of the people they claim to stand for. And often I think they just get that wrong. But it would feel like it could be an even bigger challenge in a system like that, where there's sort of an institutionalized role for those kind of, you know, nearly kind of corporatist, right, institutionalized role for representatives of those interests or those people who are affected or those groups. And if there's a real disjunct between what the interests of those groups that are affected actually are, which obviously should be taken into consideration, and the people who speak on behalf of those groups, that system may come up with all kinds of different injustices that we're not thinking of right now. I appreciate your question because I think, honestly, this is literally the forefront. This is exactly where our knowledge about how to operate constitutional democracy well, like, runs out. You know, this has been an experiment for 250 years. The experiment doesn't end. There's a need for new experimentation. So as I see it, there are really sort of three parts to the job. I mean, the first is, you know, we kind of got this concept of representation worked out. We kind of like know how it's supposed to work. We're in a position where we can do gap analyses. We can see where it's working well and where it's not. And we ought to be correcting that. Then we have the second problem, which is the one I described, the jurisdictional one, where there's kind of mismatch between the problem and the jurisdictional structure. We need to see those mismatches and then be able to innovate with regard to our jurisdictional structures. So that, again, they combine effectiveness and inclusion in an adapted form of representation. So then the third thing is the question of, you know, what do you do about decisions that in some sense are coming up through the administrative or executive branch of government, not a legislative or legislating component of government? And there, you know, again, I guess I would point to another lesson from the COVID context. If you think about the issue of schools and how hard it was in the U.S. to get schools open for healthy and safe in-person learning, one of the things that was so striking about that was about how hard it was for office holders, you know, those with, again, that sort of administrative or executive power to ask people down at the far end of the policy chain, what their perspective was. So for instance, you know, there were any number of kind of concrete cases of teachers being told, okay, what you need to do is keep the windows open when their windows were nailed shut. And the only person who could communicate that information back up the chain was the teacher because they were the only ones who knew what the actual state of affairs was in their classroom, but nobody was asking the teacher. So in that regard, I think it's incumbent on any administrative person to be doing a sort of due diligence process of getting really clear on sort of who all the stakeholders are and then pulling that information in. And you're right that that doesn't mean just sort of starting with self-appointed stakeholders. There's a way in which there has to be kind of actual real diagnosis of the shape of the issue being addressed and like where the pain points are, who's experiencing them that would lie behind your ability to sort of shape the conversations for decision making. I'll just make one last point here. There is really good knowledge and understanding about this coming out of the travails of our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
General Stanley McChrystal developed the sort of concept of fusion cells, which pulled people together from across the array of points of contact for any given problem or challenge, and didn't worry that much about where they stood in the hierarchy or the chain of command, but just made sure that sort of the people who had the best visibility into different pieces of the problem were brought together into a sort of shared deliberation space. And you don't need to make those things permanent because as the shape of the problem changes, you know, you're going to need a different conversational shape. So that's where I think, you know, elected officials, people with administrative power need to have that capacity to build and shape a conversation that actually tracks the shape of the problem. You know, honestly, I don't think this is a thing we've named. It's not a thing we teach. I think expertise in it has developed in some specific places, General McChrystal, for example, and now the organization he's built. Um, But I think it's time for us to sort of name that capacity and see it as a part of building out resources for democratic participation. Let me ask you a question that I was wondering as I was reading your forthcoming book, which is really exciting. And that's that there's sort of different things that might be wrong with not having the right kind of political equality, or there's different ways in which we might express what the problem with that is, right? And one of them is, look, when we don't have political equality, it means that some people just don't have a voice, right? It means that some people whose interests we should have at heart are overlooked. And often those are going to be exactly the kinds of people who've also been overlooked in the past because of various injustices based on race and gender and other kinds of dimensions, right? And that's obviously really bad. Another way of expressing that kind of concern is to say that, no, we just really want people to be engaged in politics and to have political agency because we care about their participation. We care about everybody just having politics to be part of their life. We talked about that distinction a little bit earlier. So I guess I was wondering how you would feel imagining that some of the practical difficulties of it could be overcome with a form of lotocracy, which is to say with a political system in which the decision makers are selected by lot. Now, that seems like a really bizarre idea, but as many people who've worked, as you have, on ancient political theory have pointed out, it actually was in many ways how people in ancient Athens and some other ancient democracies thought about democracy. They thought that the lot really was a truly democratic mechanism. Elections actually were kind of aristocratic mechanism that was supposed to select the, the best rather than ordinary people. Now, it seems to me that lotocracy may, under the right circumstances, be quite good at getting rid of one form of political inequality. Because rather than, you know, a third of the Senate being lawyers with degrees from Ivy League schools, and rather than you know, them having to raise huge amounts of money for their campaigns, which means that if they're really rich or they have connections with really rich people that help them, all those kinds of things, anybody would have an equal chance at governing. And probably the kind of committees that would end up making decisions might end up being much closer to the actual opinions of most citizens. So in one kind of way, it would feel like it really fixes the problem of political inequality. But I suspect that you sort of wouldn't like that because you would say, well, but hang on a second, you know, yes, you might be randomly selected, but for everybody else, the sort of opportunity for political agency would suddenly be gone. So explain to me why something like autocracy wouldn't fix a problem you're worried about, if I'm guessing right, which way you're going to go in your answer here. I mean, I think there's a place for the use of the lot in any political system. But let me back up a little bit. And if you don't mind, let me just register your vocabulary about the goal of sort of fixing political inequality. I mean, I think a lot of us crave a fix. <laughs> there you go. That's a kind of funny double entendre. But at any rate, there is a certain kind of addiction, I think, that we have to fixing things once and for all in politics or the hope that we can. And I know from your work that you are perfectly well attuned to the impossibility of that. You know, all there ever is, is the fighting against the darkness in a certain sense and the sort of trying to climb back into the light. And that view has been expressed in any number of ways. Iron law oligarchy, for example, you know, there's always an effort to co-opt by a small group. And in some sense, the project of democracy is always to resist that, always to undo it, always to open things back up again for a full participation and full access. And in that context, where the goal is that fullness of opening so that human possibilities are maximally available to people, you always need a toolbox, a suite of tools. There is no single tool that solves everything. 
The Athenians used lot, but they also used election. They also used appointment. So they had the whole suite and they certainly needed what we would call leadership. They had people who were elected into the role of strategos, their leading generals. Those were really the people who were sort of most equivalent to our chief executive officers. And it was really important that those people were actually selected and not chosen randomly. So I think the same thing is true for us. I think there are places that we could benefit from the use of random allotment of participation. We do that with citizen juries, for example, in the you know, sort of the context literally of the legal system. But California now uses an element of lottery for its independent redistricting commissions, for example. I think there should be more of that for sure. The notion that you might randomly be called up for service for more things than just jury duty would be very beneficial, I believe. At the same time, I do think that at the end of the day, because there is no algorithm, there is no algorithm to deliver justice. You always need people <laughs> who are working their hearts out to try to secure justice in the conditions in which justice can thrive. And for that, you also need it to be possible for people with true leadership ability to rise to the top. A lot of, you know, not so great folks also clamber to the top in that process, but we need to make the space for the opportunity to emerge for true leaders to rise to the top. You defend liberalism despite some of its historical flaws in, in the same way you defend the Declaration of Independence, despite some of the obvious injustices about late 18th century America. What is at the core of a Declaration of Independence? And what do a lot of people who may think that they know of the Declaration of Independence, a lot of people who have read it and who may even sort of look up to this as one of these great documents, what do they not know about the Declaration that they should know? Well, I mean, it's super important to recognize that the Declaration of Independence was written by many people working together. So, you know, everybody thinks it was written by Thomas Jefferson. The lesson of that is if you want credit for something, put it on your tombstone, right? Because he put in his tombstone author Declaration of Independence. And as a result of that, it's been attributed to him forever after. In fact, it was a committee. He was the chair of the committee and therefore the lead drafts person for the document. But John Adams contributed substantially. Benjamin Franklin contributed. And at the end of the day, the intellectual architecture of the Declaration is really, above all, John Adams. And we can see that from drafts of things he wrote earlier in 1776. I'm going to put on my tombstone that I invented the spaceship and uh, wait for people to start believing it. There you go. And Al Gore can finally put on his you know, tombstone that he invented the internet. And that will solve that problem <laughs> once and for all. <laughs> so at any rate, it's like that. And it matters that the people who drafted the Declaration, some of them were already abolitionists. They were already working against enslavement. Not Jefferson. Jefferson was a complicated, hypocritical person. But Franklin and Adams were both already working against enslavement. So the Declaration of Independence really has two voices in it, and it has compromises in it. It does have an anti-enslavement voice. And so the important statement about human rights, right at the top, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and so forth, was used immediately by abolitionists, and enslavement was abolished in Massachusetts before the end of the Revolutionary War. So it's important that people have that awareness about the document. And why, when you hear in the discourse today, some people say, you know, these ideas were formulated 250 years ago by people who are flawed in all kinds of ways, it's really hard to amend our constitution. Why should we be bound by the dead letter of these documents? One may agree with parts of that. I think um, you know, the United States constitution is particularly hard to amend compared to other constitutions. There may be a case for making it a little bit easier to, to amend it, for perhaps not a very realistic one. But why, more broadly, should we continue to look back at these texts and be inspired by them? Why do you think that they actually do and should help to structure our political life today? I mean, there's a whole heck of a lot of answers to that question, <laughs> sort of long answers. It's hard for me to answer that question without just quoting the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence in full. So I apologize, but I'm just going to go ahead and do that. No apologies necessary. So we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principle 
and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. This was a revolutionary statement. Revolutionary in two senses. Revolutionary because it anchored a revolution, but it was also philosophically revolutionary. It established the people as the judge for how their lives were going and acknowledged the capacity of the people to name when things were not going well and to self-consciously reorganize the powers of government in order to achieve their goals of safety and happiness. Nobody had ever put that much acknowledgement of the power and capacity of the people on paper before. Not Locke, not Hobbes. It gets an actual break, a forward movement, a certain kind of, you know, what I call eudaimonistic pragmatism that is sort of cared about the human flourishing of all, wanted to make that pragmatic. They screwed up because they thought it was possible to organize the powers of government by putting the hands of the power only of men with property, as if that then could still yield protection of rights for all. That is not possible. Absolute power over others leads to abuse of others, period. Powers have to be shared broadly. That's where power sharing liberalism comes in as reconstruction beyond that original moment. But the point is, that original incredibly pithy statement is very profound in its articulation of human agency and what is possible when we acknowledge human agency. I honestly don't think, and it's been matched since then, the fact that the ideas were profound and people began to experiment with executing them from the time is something that we should learn from. I think it's totally reasonable to argue with those ideas, even to propose alternatives. But I believe those arguments should start from a place of understanding. That's the thing I ask. So let's go from some of the theory we've been talking about to some more practical questions. And I do think one of those practical questions is how much our institutions will have to change to work in the 21st century and to help to overcome some of the divisions in our society today. I know you've thought about that. You often want to report on that. Is the problem that explains the rise of Donald Trump and all of those things really our institutions? And to what extent is the fix going to be renewing our institutions? What can we do to actually change the structure of our political system in a way that really make a difference for the health and stability of our democracy? So I appreciate it. You're referring to a report called Our Common Purpose that I had the pleasure of helping to draft. And this was a report issued by a commission for which I was a co-chair. It was a commission sponsored by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And we released our report in June of 2020. The purpose of the commission was to think about the future of American democracy and try to propose a forward path. The American Academy has been around for a really long time. We predate the revolution, actually. So we were founded by the same folks as ultimately wrote the Constitution and all that. So John Hancock and John Adams and Ben Franklin, George Washington was an early member. And the purpose of the Academy was that, you know, this crazy new country, this weird experiment in self-government would always need, they thought, knowledge resources to help it meet the challenges of the day. And so we took up that charge in beginning to think about the challenges with democracy. Now, the Academy over time, I mean, it's done work on things like nuclear proliferation and stuff like that. It's always had a habit of building out expert commissions commissioning reports and white papers to support its work. We did that, of course, but we actually also did something else. We held listening sessions all over the country and with people from very different kinds of backgrounds, you know, those deeply committed to service like naval cadets and those who don't vote at all and people from both political parties and the like. But there was one person, one gentleman in Maine at a listening session there who said something that really gave us the kind of core concept of our set of proposals for securing a healthy democracy. And he said, basically, you know, isn't it sort of like right now we're experiencing kind of a vicious circle, our institutions don't really deliver for us. And then that makes it feel like, why should I engage And when we don't actually engage and participate, then our kind of awareness of each other, our commitment to each other sort of degrades. And he said, isn't democracy supposed to be a virtuous circle? And we really latched onto that idea and recognized that, yes, it's not just about institutions. We do need institutional reform. And there are things we can do to our institutions so that they will be responsive and effective. But we need those reforms partly in order to re-inspire people to participate and bring people back into the civil society organizations that give them the chance of learning about each other and learning how to bridge differences. And of course, we need a media ecosystem that pulls all that together. So that's a very long-winded way of saying that. Yes, there are things we can do to adjust our political institutions. And I don't see why we should anticipate less change in this century than either of our previous centuries have seen. 
And if we stop and think about that, we've got a lot of change ahead of us, right? And if you think about how much institutional change there was in the 19th century, how much in the 20th century, we have a lot of change ahead of us. But at the same time that we have institutional change ahead of us, we need cultural change. We need those elites to abandon technocracy and paternalism. That doesn't mean abandoning expertise, but it means recognizing that their expertise needs to be complemented by the expertise of that teacher in the classroom who knew her windows were nailed shut. So what are some of the top institutional changes that you would argue for? Increasing the size of the House of Representatives. So growing Congress, basically. And in the U.S., our national legislature was built to fuse two principles, the principle of popular sovereignty and the principle of forming an association of states. So the House represents the popular principle. The Senate represents the association of states. And the House was always supposed to grow in its size every 10 years so that its shape could shift as the population of the country shifted. But about 100 years ago, it was capped for no very good reason at all. So we haven't grown for 100 years. Think of it as deferred maintenance. Growing the House would be easy if you were doing it every 10 years. But when you got been waiting for 100 years and you haven't grown it at all, man, no wonder it doesn't fit. So, you know, the British Parliament, the German Bundestag are both bigger than our Congress. So bigger is certainly possible. There's no impossibility about it. It would mean we had a chance at more diverse representation, more seats to go around. It would bring a dynamism back to our politics. And it would also rebalance the Electoral College because the actual number of people in the Electoral College flows directly from the number of people in Congress and the number of people in the Senate. So it would restore the balance, reweight in the direction of the more populated parts of the country, undo the sort of excessive weighting on behalf of the less populated parts of the country. That's probably the reason why it's hard to do this reform, right? Because in principle, this should be the kind of reform that's easy to pass, because both political parties have an interest in saying, hey, we have more seats, I'm less likely to lose re-election, and there's more sports to go around, why not increase the size of the House? But I presume that one of the difficulties of passing it is that it might favor the Democratic Party and the Electoral College, and so therefore Republicans have an institutional interest in opposing it. It's actually a little hard to say who would favor. It's not clear. You can't model it out favoring either side. And when you stop and think about it, you realize that's because what are the four most populous states? California, Texas, Florida, New York. Okay. So it's not clear which side it benefits. That's an interesting point. So why haven't politicians passed this? Because many of the reforms that people suggest either would take tremendously difficult change in terms of the mechanism required for it, or they would just go against the interest of the incumbent power holders, right? I mean, when it comes to questions like proportional representation, might be good for the country. I think that's actually a complicated question. But it's just obviously Democrats and Republicans are going to work together to impede that because the power of both the Democratic and the Republican Party would presumably be lower under a system of proportional representation. So that's kind of a very straightforward institutional explanation for why it's so hard to get off the ground. But increasing the number of seats in the House, especially if it's not clear that it's going to give one side a partisan advantage in presidential elections, seems like something that should be in the in the interest of a political class. So why can't we build consensus around that? So I think it's because it doesn't actually affect the balance of power between the parties, but it does affect every single incumbent who actually is a current office holder. And not because necessarily their prospects would be so badly damaged, but as a certain same-day voter registration was moving forward as a potential reform, it had support sort of in both houses. And then the governor, I think it was a Democrat at the time, was getting ready to sort of support it when his political advisor said to him, look, you know, governor, right now I know exactly where every single person who votes for you is. Why would we change that? That's the issue. You increase the size of the house, you change districts. So it's like a redistricting problem on steroids, basically. So it's not that it affects the balance of power for parties, but every incumbent is afraid of losing the list of voters they already know. That's very interesting. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I'm going to change speed again, and you have but yourself to blame for this because you've written about too many things in two interesting ways. Perhaps my favorite work by you is very personal work about your baby cousin who was born with very different prospects in life, very different opportunities in life, and who ended up being killed. Tell us about his story and about what we can learn from it. I mean, you're talking about my cousin, Michael, and we lost Michael in 2009, just before he was 30. 
And I think the thing about Michael's story is, in a sense, he didn't start out with such different prospects from me. I mean, I wouldn't say they were identical, but they weren't worlds apart from each other. We both grew up in Southern California. Our parents had grown up in Northern Florida and had fled the Jim Crow South looking for a new opportunity in Southern California. And my dad was the older. Michael's mother was his younger sister. So it's certainly the case that my dad was making more forward progress professionally than his sister. You know, he was a professor. His sister ultimately became a nurse, but she was definitely, you know, it was a sort of much longer pathway up there for her. And, you know, growing up in this world of many aunts and uncles and many, many cousins, there were a lot of us. And the experience of that growing up was really, I think of it as what I call the great coming apart, just as this country over the 50 years of my lifetime, 71 to the present, has experienced this great coming apart, great pulling apart. So did did our family. So my lifetime has been exactly parallel to this incredible increase in income inequality and wealth inequality, to the incredible increase in mass incarceration, and so forth. And that's what we experienced in my family. So some of us ended up having the most extraordinary opportunities. Here I sit as a tenured professor at Harvard, and I have too many dead cousins or debilitated cousins. And in Michael's case in particular, he was arrested on a first arrest at the age of 15, 1995, a first arrest for an attempted carjacking in Southern California. That was an obviously terrible thing to have done. It was also a time, though, when punishment in California was at its most intense. So on that first arrest, He got a sentence of 12 years and eight months and served almost all of that from the age of 15. And that was the decisive fact of his life. So he'd had two years out at the point in 2009 when he was shot and killed by somebody he had met while he was in prison. So that was a real life turning point moment for me and really pulled my attention into the question of how is it that we've built traps for people, traps that catch talented people. I mean, Michael was an exceptionally talented young man. He was bright, full of curiosity, charismatic. He made mistakes. He made bad mistakes. He had no second chance. And that was that, in effect. And so, you know, that's really sort of me. The question is how to undo the traps um, that we built for people. And traps that result in the fact that some folks have just a much higher degree of difficulty for their life than others. You know, a single slip is catastrophic, whereas others in other circumstances make a similar single slip, but it's not catastrophic. Yeah, I wonder whether a lot of things that are hard to understand about America stem from the fact that the stakes are so high. And the stakes are high everywhere. And of course, there's people who become tremendously rich and have great opportunity and people who die violent deaths or people who die deaths because of drug use and so on in virtually every country in the world. But it just feels in the United States that the stakes of whether or not you make bad decisions when you're 15, the stakes of whether or not you do well in school, the stakes of whether or not you go to college are just much more intense than they are in other societies that I know well. And that's both unjust because of how it deprives people like your cousin of of an opportunity to flourish in life. But I wonder whether it also helps to explain so much else about the anxiety and the hatred and the polarization and the general sort of political background music in this in this political moment. Mm-hmm. I think it does. I mean, I think we are a society just, you know, riven by anxiety right now. And I think your way of describing it as the stakes being so high is on target. I do think that is a generationally different experience from prior generations. I mean, my parents' generation, my dad's generation, were folks who started out as working class or lower middle class, I mean, really working class, basically. And collectively, the whole cohort was able to sort of ratchet themselves up to another level. And for my generational cohort, that has not been possible. And that contrast is very powerful. And so I think... Yes, the traps that are available for people and substance use disorder is a huge part of that. But also, you know, you make one slip and then you can't get housing, you can't get into school, you can't, you know, get a job again because you've got a sort of felony on your record has produced an extraordinary degree of hopelessness for (laughs) obvious reasons. And then that hopelessness ricochets um, and produces other sort of problematic phenomena. So, you know, I've been an advocate to end the war on drugs for quite some time at this point, going on headed towards 15 years. And, you know, I'm also an advocate for really focusing our political economy 
on basic building blocks, housing, transportation, schools, good jobs. All of those things have to exist in proximity to each other for anybody to have a chance. In the 19th century, this country had a kind of focus on this concept of internal improvements. How do you put the infrastructure in place that give people the chance to stand up and build a life for themselves? I believe we should replace our kind of safety net conception with that foundation of flourishing conception, that we should be invested in internal improvements that yield an infrastructure pack that make it possible for people to stand up and find a pathway to flourishing. Let me ask you a last question. You know, we are at a really pessimistic moment in American politics for good reasons. It would be easy to list all of the reasons to be really pessimistic. Are you pessimistic? And if not, what gives you hope? What should give us hope that 10 or 20 years from now, we might look at this country and feel a little bit more optimistic about how things are going and what we might be able to achieve together? Well, you know, I feel certainly sad about the degree of pain that our country is in right now. And I say our country as if a country can feel, but I guess I just mean all of us together in relationship to each other. You know, we're in a sad way for sure. As you know, I'm a person who believes in the value of self-government for free and equal citizens to each and every human being. I think there is no better way of building a life for human beings. As a result, from my point of view, failure is not an option. So I always say, I'm not an optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm just a not an optionist. Failure is not an option. And in terms of things that are hope giving and bringing, you know, human beings have an incredible capacity to solve their problems. All we have to do is name them. <laughs> and I do see us naming our problems. I see us making a lot of progress with naming our problems. And so that gives me hope that we will also solve our problems. And now, Alan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Yasha. It's always fun to talk with you. I so appreciate what you're doing with this conversation. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please make suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.